Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us to help choose home when care is needed, a podcast all about the benefits, value, and safety of receiving care and services in the one place that feels most comfortable, wherever it is that the person needing care calls home. I'm your host, Marilee Orsini, and I've been involved in health care at home since 1981. Before we meet today's guest, a brief thank you to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and Core Cubed. Today's episode is number seven of season four. Our guest today is Dr. Timothy Erig, the Chief Medical Officer of Crossroads Hospice and Palliative Care. He's also founder and Chief Executive Officer of Erig MD and Associates, and an internationally recognized expert in palliative care and hospice medicine with a visionary approach to care. Please help me, won't you? And welcome Dr. Timothy Erig to help choose home. First, let me thank you, Dr. Tim, so much for joining us today. I always learn so much from you. So let's just jump right into it. What are the kinds of things that are on your mind right now as you are working with uh, your patients and clients in the community? Well, before I jump into that, thank you so much for allowing me back. It's always an honor and a pleasure. I enjoyed our last conversation and I look to learn and and grow from you during this time as well. You know, what's on my mind is always, how do we care for people? How do we elevate the care narrative? How do we look at what's really the greatest social issue of our time, caring for elderly ill people as it increases significantly? We're coming off a a global pandemic, well, not, you know, coming off it, dealing with still. And so I think it's brought to light a lot of the things that resonate deeply with me is, is how we think about life, how we think about death, how we translate inevitability to opportunities, you know, to live and love and learn and grow and to do those things at home, you know, what resources are available. And, and really my job is to empower people to do a couple of things. One, to know where they're at and to align, you know, with their innate sense of, of being and self is telling them with some clinical realities and then to empower them with the, the real choices, which after a certain point, you know, there's nothing we can't do at home. We just too often fail to recognize opportunities beyond escalating clinical intervention. Right? You know, you and I were chatting a little before we started to record that you know, one of the things that I find egregious with the system of medicine is, you know, as a physician and a lot of my colleagues are trained to recognize disease and debility and then to do something to the disease or debility. And if either of those increases, we do more to it. And that really precludes doing anything with or for the person, you know, we're charged to care for. You know, I was, a, I was a second year internal medicine resident when I was on call in the intensive care unit and there was a code and it was an 80-some year old woman who had a hip fracture and she didn't come off the ventilator and she was in the ICU and it was two or three in the morning. She, she coded, her heart stopped. And so I'm doing chest compressions and, you know, the, the gamut of things. And, and it was during that period when I looked and I saw her husband and family surrounded and I, I don't mean to be explicit here, but felt her ribs crack, you know, and it's this frail elderly woman, you know, she had died and she was never given the choice of this surgery could be risky or not. Hip was broken. We have to fix it is the mantra. There was no recognition of where is she at in her journey of life and, and what are the opportunities to recognize her capacity to heal or recover and to offer appropriate care choices. You know, it, it doesn't exist. And so, you know, she should have had the option of having her pain taken care of and and going home. And I believe she had pretty advanced dementia as well. So we miss a lot of opportunities when we have a myopic view of curative strategies, even when curative strategies fail to offer any any benefit. You know, I was thinking quite a lot about uh, yesterday was my mother's birthday and she died four and a half years ago, but we always celebrate her birthday. In the last couple of weeks of her life, 
she had an early onset rapidly progressive dementia and in stage lung disease. And she had a bad fall and, and got taken to the emergency department as we were discussing transitioning her to a hospice level of care. And so I called and, and was speaking with my father and the attending physician in the emergency department that night. And he wanted nephrology and neurology and pulmonology and, you know, all the ologies. And I said, respectfully, my mom's dying. Oh, she's not dying. There's, you know, we did a CAT scan. There's nothing wrong with her head and this and that. And the labs look, she's a little dry, dehydrated, but there's nothing wrong. I said, well, what you fail to recognize is the journey she's been on the last six years and what she's been on uh, the trajectory the last couple of months. And, and I walked him through it and I said, you know, thank you, but let's keep her comfortable and I'll be in town tomorrow and we'll discuss a transition to home with hospice level of care. And it was absolutely foreign. We lack the ability to see these opportunities when inevitability is right in front of us. You know, even and when somebody's actively dying, colleagues can't recognize that they're actively dying. And, and, you and so that precludes us the opportunity to go home. You mentioned earlier, though, that it's the narrative that is missing that narrative of what is actually happening in the reality of the situation and where do we go from there? It sounds like that was missing in your mother's situation as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, outside of discussions I've had with my father and my brother, you know, and, and our respective spouses, again, going back to doing the chest compressions in the ICU at three in the morning, I had no idea that people died. I'd gone through medical school. I was a second year internal medicine resident. And this epiphany was, oh my goodness. And so we in medicine and healthcare are lacking a fundamental acknowledgement that death is a reality, that death is inevitable. And that lack of acknowledgement precludes us from accepting. It. And, and by acceptance, I don't mean, yeah, we just don't do anything. We don't look for interventions that may quell a disease if the opportunity exists, et cetera, et cetera. But we just don't even accept that it is a reality. And that precludes us from creating a real vernacular to talk about it, to think about it, uh, to talk about it with our colleagues and with patients and families and caregivers. And what that does with many other, you know, pressures and lever arms that, that push us down the clinical escalation and care pathway we're not able to translate reality into alternative care choices. And alternative, I don't mean wacky, crazy, you know, way out, never heard of before things. But I mean, if you are diagnosed with a widely metastatic pancreatic cancer, and I've been the person in the room dozens of times, you know, the reality is your median life expectancy is six to eight months, no matter what is done, chemotherapy or not major interventional, you know, ripple surgery to remove part of your pancreas or not. You know, the outcome is, to be very frank, you're dead in, in six to eight months. And I don't say that to be mean or curt, but we have to say, okay, I, I have to accept that. You can be angry, you can grieve, but let's take away the paralytic fear and shift the narrative from trying to beat Mother Nature, which is 100% of the time going to be a failure, to how do you want to live your life? How do we want to empower people to take charge of whatever time they have, given whatever they have, based on what's sacred to them? And, and so, you know, it, it manifests the last 20 years from what I just learned from my parents as caregivers is the, the four questions I've asked every patient I've ever had. One is, how are you? And then I pause and, and I ask again, I say, how are you? And if we're quiet long enough, they will tell us everything. No need to read a chart don't need a CAT scan. They may not use clinical terms, but they'll say, look, I woke up a couple months ago and something was different. And ever since then, the succession of things have been happening. And, and Dr. Tim, I think I'm dying. And inevitably, radiology comes back, labs come back. And yeah, they didn't know they had a widely, med widely metastatic medullary thyroid cancer, but they knew something had changed, right? And then you ask, are you scared? And it's interesting because almost 100% of the people I've, I've walked this journey with that said, Doc, you know, I'm not scared of dying. That's not the question I asked. I said, are you scared? That death is on their mind manifests from what they know about themselves and inevitability, right? And it's our mm -hmm. lack of ability to articulate that 
and translate it to clinical realities that we fail people. And so what they're really scared of is, is the time between now and when they die. And we fail people so often because they're scared of the unknown. We can map it out. And we can, again, shift from that question, do you want to die, to how do you want to live? And so the third question is, what is sacred to you? Which throughout our lives never really changes, right? The intensity of it or the, or the, the sensation we have to address components of what's sacred to us sooner rather than later may change given a diagnosis of cancer or lung disease or dementia. But what's sacred to us doesn't change. And that should be the guide that allows us to, to plan proactively, you know, days, weeks, or months. And then the last question, which is the most accurate prognostic indicator, and this is the one that I think is the one that should empower us to look at care choices and, and the focus of the show is partially how do we care for each other at home, allow us to feel comfortable bypassing a lot of the clinical interventions that the reality is aren't going to do us any good, may harm us and even cure, kill us sooner than not. I ask, what's your little voice telling you? And people will say, just like a dear friend of mine six weeks ago called me and said, Tim, I, I just got back from the doctor. I've been feeling well. And they did a CAT scan and head to toe, I'm full of cancer. We don't know what the primary is, but it, it, I just lit up like a Christmas tree. And so we talked and, you know, there's no treatment that's going to cure him. And I said, what's your little voice say? And he said, I hope I'm here on Father's Day so I can spend it with my family and my kids. Right there, I know his life expectancy is, you know, six to eight weeks because people know. And, and so the opportunity for him was to say, what sacred you is your family. This is what your little voice is telling you. Here's accepting, acknowledging, and translating inevitability. Where do you want to live your life? Because I want to be at home. He said, Tim, is chemotherapy and radiation, all this stuff going to do anything for me? I said, it's not going to fix you. You're still going to die. Heck, you're still going to die even if you didn't have cancer. We all are. How do we make it so you can be at home and live your life rather than dying a thousand times before you draw your last breath? We need to come to a higher level of understanding of when somebody's capacity to heal or recover is, is diminishing and then non-existent. Because the care choices, the clinical intervention care choices that exist are antithetical, really, to doing anything positive for people at that time. So to get home, right, that's, I think, an imperative is for us to reframe what we think about living and dying and how we think about caring for people. And how do we do that? Because I, I shared with you a family member who, after a recent operation, actually said to me, I really for the first time I've realized I'm going to die. I, I thought I, and I, I said, you mean you thought you weren't going to die? And he said, no, he said, I thought I was going to escape that. So how do we change the narrative? So people realize death is a part of life. That's a great question. I, I think there's multifaceted one. Let's just tackle it from the system of medicine perspective. We have to have a construct that allows us to recognize when you know, people are wearing out circle of life. Like physiologically, we all got a, a finite lifespan, every living organism on the planet. And if we don't seek to find out when those changes are occurring, it, you know, prevents us from acknowledging inevitability, again, talking about it and, and, and finding relevant care choices. And I think we need to start with the premise that it's not about dying. It's about living. All of medicine is focused on overcoming disease and debility, not caring for human beings. You know, there's there's financial incentives. Let's let's call a spade a spade, right? The, the, the system, the business of medicine is I do unto you and I'm reimbursed. I do unto you whether you need it or not, whether the outcome is positive or not, whether I've done it to you a thousand times before is irrelevant. I, I, I do something to you regardless of the capacity of it to change to the positive you know, your journey forward, guaranteed reimbursement. And, and then I'm trained to believe that death or lack of clinical escalation is failure, right? So 
us goofy long white coat physicians potentiate the belief that unless you're taking that third round experimental chemotherapy, you're not fighting. And if that chemotherapy fails, you have failed chemotherapy. It's asinine. People don't fail chemotherapy. Their bodies wear out. People aren't given a choice. And so it starts with us to realize that we failed people with advanced illness and at the end of life. And more often than not, you know, we cause harm. We potentiate a, a more rapid decline. And when we fail to define what we're fighting for, when we fail to define exactly what it is we hope for, we steal hope, right? And we have this fixed false belief, which is a delusion that if someone chooses to go home and play with the grandkids, that they are a failure. And that's just very, very sad commentary on, on healthcare. From a societal perspective, you know, what I've seen over the last three decades is unless you're on the cover of GQ magazine or Vogue magazine, you know, you've done something wrong. I turned 52 next week and, and I'm not getting any younger and, and I've got some gray hairs and I don't fit into that category. And, and my father, who's 84, my mother, when she was ill, you know, society deems them as, as having done something wrong. We need to elevate societal narrative to embrace living across the ages. And I really think it is a societal phenomenon. I've done some work in Tanzania, and they don't want to die any more than we do. And Neri have access to, you know, an aspirin in most of the places I've worked. So they have an absolute understanding of inevitability and an acceptance of it. And it doesn't mean they don't fight and they don't hope for cure, but there's a more profound realism to how they live their lives. And it really shifts that narrative so that they can live and love and learn and grow rather than I'm so focused on defeating mother nature. And it's contradictory to what my little voice is telling me. Right? Got all these white coats saying we need to do X, Y, and Z and the next Y and Z again. And it's contradictory to what my little voice is, is telling me. And there's an increasing tension in that relationship. And so we focus on trying to defeat death. We cease to live our lives. And how many times over the last 15 years have people said, I really feel abandoned and as though the healthcare system, my physicians have stolen from me the opportunity to choose how I want to live. When at the end of the day, those physicians say, there's nothing else we can do. Why don't you go to hospice? Which is egregious because there's always something we can do, and that's care. This seems to me, this is where palliative care actually comes in, correct? When someone has decided that they would like to have their symptoms moderated or reduced, but that they are going to live their life as opposed to continue to experimental therapies or whatever. I, you know, partially correct. So, so palliative care, and, and I'm, I'm going to even be critical of my own group of, of providers here in a second. Palliative care can be delivered concurrently, you know, with the most aggressive therapies to help mitigate any symptoms, pain, shortness of breath, anxiety, and to really frame, you know, put the whole puzzle together. Is this a therapy that's working or not? What's a risk versus benefit? Unfortunately, my clan, the palliative care group, suffers as much from a lack of identifying inevitability and being able to translate it upstream as, as the rest of healthcare. Palliative care practices at the pleasure of those who control the revenue stream, which is oncology and cardiology. And, and most of us are just happy to get involved in you know, the last weeks or months of someone's life. Well, when we recognize that the care opportunities are much sooner than that, when we recognize that a majority of the things that are done to individuals in our population have no benefit whatsoever of increasing life expectancy or quality, when we fail to act on that, we're complicit in, in causing as much harm as that third line chemotherapy. So medicine, palliative care included, 
is way too myopic and, and practices in a sandbox that ascribes to curative therapy until the bottom of the ninth, when curative therapy may have actually started causing harm in the, in the top of the sixth inning. But how do we identify when the curative therapy is causing harm in a way that the patient can understand that what their choices are? I'm going to put the onus on, on both us, uh, medical professionals, and every individual themselves. One, you know, the, the, the irony is you, you read all the research papers and you ask a physician, you know, if you had widely metastatic pancreatic cancer, would you want all that? Almost unanimously, you know, even oncologists are like, no, I'm going to go fishing with my kids. And, and that's a very profound statement because they know the end result is the same. And the majority of things that, that are done to the disease, they certainly don't change the trajectory and they actually can cause more harm. You know, why would a physician say, I, I don't want that? So we need to hold ourselves accountable as physicians. And again, there's a huge economic elephant in the room that, um, that drives a lot of this. And then secondly, I would encourage every human being, your little voice is always 100% absolutely spot on. It knows when things have changed. It knows better than I ever will as a physician if things are moving in the right direction or not. We as consumers, right, patients, need to have faith in our little voice and not ascribe all of our faith and trust to the long white coat because we can't see it, right? The long white coats are precluded from seeing what we're talking about here, you know, more often than not. And we have to be advocates for ourselves. When we feel that tension between our little voices and what a physician is telling us, this is your life, darn it. Have a voice, make a stand, challenge us on this side of the bed. Don't let us off the hook. Ask the tough questions. Seek other providers. Don't allow fear to paralyze you to walking down a path of just succumbing to whatever's prescribed for us. You know, the, the, the caveat I have to say is I'm not, I'm not knocking medicine. Medicine does wonderful things. I'm, I'm talking about there's a point in our lives where it ceases to be efficacious. You know, 52, if, if I had a broken hip, yeah, I'd go to orthopedics and say, I want this fixed. But if you're 86 and you have end-stage dementia, that's a whole different ballgame. But the system of medicine doesn't look at it differently. It doesn't recognize the differences. Patients and family members more often do, but their voices are silenced because the system says, do you want to die? Nobody wants to die. System should ask, how do you want to live? Let's put the puzzle together. And that's our ticket home more often than not, because services can be brought to the home almost regardless of whatever disease one has, functional level, to honor that which is sacred to the individual. Is, is there a place that we're close to the end of our time here? So for the consumer listening to this, and I think this is a huge issue that's probably been brought to the forefront more this in this last year during the pandemic because we faced situations that we had never faced before in terms of numbers <laughs> with no control. Mm -hmm. So where could a consumer go? Or is there reading or is there counseling or where could a consumer go to understand more about the questions that they should ask or how to change the narrative so they are dealing with their loved one in a positive manner as opposed to continuing the intervention if the intervention isn't being isn't healing yeah i would offer and i've done this for years drop me an email if, if any of us Anyone out there is listening and is curious to learn more or has a question, you know, about personal journey or a loved one's journey. I have these conversations and have for the past 20 years with people all over the world. I need you and you need me 
at some level, you know, because of what we're talking about here, but more often because we're human beings walking the journey of life together. And mm -hmm. I would encourage people to, if they're comfortable, reach directly out to me. I, I will respond. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about obtaining, harnessing, you know, nurturing a greater sense of control over what is a progressive loss of control or a sense of, of loss of control as we age and, and face our inevitability. And if we can do that together, right, if you and I can empower someone to have a greater sense of control, it allows them to do those things, to live and love and learn and grow through their last breath. So they can find me on the web at irigmd.com, I-H-R-I-G-M-D.com. I don't charge anything, so just, just so people know, this is a human human connection thing. So there you go. Well, I certainly hope you're not inundated with a lot of people in the one sense and the other, <laughs> other I sense. I hope I am. I hope you are, because that I hope means I am. <laughs> you've touched some people. Well, Dr. Tim, thank you so much for your time today. And um, as, as always, it's interesting and thought provoking to hear what you have to say. And I hope that as we are moving, you know, along on our life trajectory, that, that we can change this narrative and, and really work more on how do we want to live our final day. So I appreciate your voice in that and your call to action in that. And I appreciate your time today. Well, thank you so much. It's always, it's always an honor. And you enjoy the rest of your day. And, and again, thank you. Thank you so much for listening today. And a special thanks to our sponsors and partners, the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, Access, and Core Cubed. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to our podcast and take the time to leave a review on Apple Podcast. We are now also on Spotify and most other places where you find podcasts. Like and follow us on social media and join us, won't you, to spread the word and help choose home when care is needed. Mm -hmm.